the drought uh, is the cause of a lot of our challenges in the state of California. Um, and of course, the cause of uh, uh, many of our calamities uh, uh, that we have had, especially as it relates to fire and uh, um, and the uh, ensuing uh, disasters that come after that. So uh, for our draft panel, um, we're delighted to have uh, Jeannie Jones of the uh, Interstate Resource Manager for California Department of Water Resources. Um, Always happy to see one of our own. Uh, Brad Coffey happens to be a, a former student of mine and uh, uh, with the Metropolitan Water District uh, um, and the Water Resources Management Group. Um, uh, Casey uh, Shahan is a uh, special project manager for the Fresno uh, Irrigation District. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, Brent uh, Sunamoto is the district engineer and the Assistant General Manager for the Fresno Metropolitan Flood Control District. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the region, the Southern California region, managing through this current drought emergency. And I will characterize it as current drought emergency, uh, even though we've had significant amounts of, of precipitation. So first of all, a little bit about Metropolitan Water District. Metropolitan Water District, is the wholesaler of water to the Southern California region. From Fort Wyneme and Ventura County to the Mexican border, we provide uh, water to about 19 million people in a 5,200 square mile service area in six counties. Now we wholesale water to 26 member public agencies, such as the city of Los Angeles, the city of Pasadena, Municipal Water District Orange County, uh, large uh, public agencies throughout the region. And we supply about half of the water to the region, and that supports a $1.6 trillion economy, which would be bigger than all but 12 nations in the world. So the sources of water for Southern California are threefold. First of all, there's local supplies, which can provide a little bit less than half of the water needs of the region. And then there's imported water from the Colorado River Aqueduct, which supplies about a quarter of the needs, and water from the Western Sierras, the State Water Project, which provides about 30% of the needs. Now, many of you all may also be familiar with the Los Angeles Aqueduct. Um, for this presentation, we're considering that a local supply since it's supplied by the city of Los Angeles, but it is actually an imported supply as well. So what's been most significant about this drought? Our water supply from Northern California, we get from the California State Water Project. And in an average three years, we would get 3.2 million acre feet of water each year. Now, an acre foot of water is exactly what it sounds like. It's one acre, a volume of, of water that would be one acre in area, one foot deep. It's an old agricultural term. Uh, used for people who are, are who are irrigating uh, farmland, but it's 326,000 gallons or makes up the needs for about three Southern California families. So on average, it's about 3.2 million acre feet. But during 20, the year 2020 uh, 20 through 2022, we received uh, only 0 0.6 million acre feet in those three years. Importantly, that was 40% lower than the California Department of Water Resources ever projected as the lowest uh, three-year average. So that's really what stressed our infrastructure during this current drought. Now, water storage is really our region's emergency savings account, both for drought and for earthquakes. So let me walk you through this graphic. On the blue bars, you see the total storage capacity for water that would support Southern California. And that's increased over 13 fold from the 1980s. Now in the orange bars, that's emergency water storage. And that's water that we keep in surface water storage in Southern California on this side of the San Andreas Fault in order to protect against a rupture on the San Andreas Fault that would cut off the Colorado River Aqueduct, both branches of the State Water Project, 
and the Los Angeles Aqueduct. And that's 600 or 750,000 acre feet today. Then the green bars, which you see rising and falling, is the volume of dry year storage above that minimum emergency storage pool that we use to regulate between dry and wet years. Now, it's not one big reservoir. It's really a portfolio of 14 different water storage uh, uh, places. Some of them, for example, are in Lake Mead, other of them are in groundwater basins in the Central Valley. And you can further divide them up by whether water from the Colorado River is stored in them or water from Northern California, the State Water Project is stored in them, or a blend. So you can see different levels of complexity. Another level of complexity is whether this water is stored as surface water in reservoirs or as groundwater. And a couple of differences that that makes. One is that groundwater typically has a smaller straw that one can take from that to deliver to the region and a bit lower of a put capacity, unlike a reservoir where you can also uh, where you can often take or put a vo large volumes of water in any year. And then finally, inside the region and outside the region. Um, outside the region, such as in Lake Mead or in storage in San Luis Reservoir or in groundwater basins up in the Central Valley. And that's important uh, for its vulnerability to earthquakes. And so this is our main way of protecting the region from drought emergencies and from earthquake emergencies. Now, we're really talking about a drought emergency, but let me talk just briefly about the earthquake emergency. Our kind of design emergency is the 7.8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, which rips from the Salton Sea up to Gorman, and it moves about three meters um, across that whole region. And on the lower left is a graphic of what uh, we believe could happen to one of our tunnels bringing water in from the Colorado River Aqueduct. And so that storage emergency storage volume is based on the expected repair times if we get this type of damage on our aqueduct system. Now, storage has its limits in, in that it must be connected to the demand. And I talked about our storage being in different locations and different types. And basically the near failure of the State Water Project over the past three years meant that areas that were highly dependent on that water source um, could not receive enough water to meet their normal needs. And those were six agencies from Cayagas Municipal Water District through the Inland Empire Utilities Agency, uh, a population of about six or seven million people. So about a third of the population of the region, including the city of Los Angeles, that we had to um, develop an emergency water conservation program in order to live within the amount of water that we could get to that region. Now that's really unacceptable to us and we're working hard to prevent this kind of differential access to water from ever happening again. What we had to do was really, we, we had to discriminate between different types of water use. And so in order to preserve water use for human health and safety, for cooking, cleaning, fire protection, uh, we had to roll back the amount of water that people could use outdoors. So those six agencies had to either live within strict volumetric limits or had to cut back their outdoor watering to one day per week. Now, for many areas of Southern California, for um, even uh, efficient landscapes, uh, watering of 10 minutes one day per week in the summer is really a deficit irrigation. That's, that's beyond efficient water use. And we've committed to providing an equivalent level of water supply reliability by improving our distribution system, by working on our imported water sources, uh, and by increasing the amount of storage that we have. So this provides kind of the six main areas that we're working in. I'm sure you've been reading about the Colorado River drought, and we're negotiating with uh, six, uh, seven uh, total basin states uh, and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to come up with 
some new interim uh, guidelines for operating the river uh, through 2026 when we'll have longer term guidelines. We're also working to modernize and secure supply reliability in the state water project. Uh, that's a, an extremely important source of water and it flows through the Delta, which is a critical habitat area. We wanna to continue to improve and advance water efficiency, even though the per capita water use in Southern California has dropped by over 40% since the early 1990s, there's still more work to be done, particularly going at outdoor irrigation of turf. We're also developing new local supplies by supporting our member agencies with groundwater desalting, uh, with some ocean desalting, and with advancing recycled water. Uh, the lower left is again about us being able to connect our infrastructure and have additional drought actions that we would only need to turn in or turn on during a drought. And then finally, we're working with Los Angeles County uh, on a project treating and turning the wastewater at the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant in Carson, which discharges treated wastewater to the Pacific Ocean and turning that into an engine of groundwater replenishment for the region and also potentially to supplement our surface supplies. So that's just a little bit about this current emergency, how storage is critical in managing through these emergencies and some of the things that we're doing about it moving forward. And those conclude my remarks, Frank. Uh, thank you, uh, Brad, very much um, uh, for that presentation. So we'll be talking about drought from the state perspective, the big picture, and a little background on uh, what we experience. So first of all, drought is a normal feature of California's climate, and we should expect it to occur. If we look at the statewide uh, uh, stream flow, for example, runoff, uh, we can see that we've had some very significant droughts in the past, especially the very dry period of the 1920s and 1930s. But if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, you will see that we are um, once again experiencing a steep decline, but this time we are starting from a lower peak, so to speak, which is concerning from a water management standpoint. Now, if we look at California's biggest droughts in the historical record, uh, defining drought as consecutive dry years, the ones that were particularly severe from a hydrologic standpoint are highlighted in red. And you might notice we see more droughts in the latter part of the historical record than in the earlier part. And there's a reason for this. What we are now seeing with drought, what we've experienced in the current drought and our immediately prior drought of 2012 to 2016, is that these droughts are occurring in a context of climate warming and that definitely increases drought impacts. And we have very definitely seen different drought impacts, in other words, worse, in the current and immediately prior drought than we saw in California's past historical droughts. So just an example of some of the impacts that we've seen in our current drought. So in the prior, immediately prior drought, for the first time ever, the Central Valley Project had a zero allocation to its agricultural customers. Well, in the current drought, not only has that happened two years in a row, but also for their urban or, or municipal and industrial contractors, they were forced to um, limit them to a health and safety allocation only, uh, which was a, a first for them and very significant for a number of small water systems, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we also saw the unexpected uh, restrictions in supply that were just mentioned in the MWD service area because of MWD's um, uh, lack of ability with current infrastructure to move water to the uh, western parts of its service area. We also saw for the first time a declared shortage in the lower Colorado River Basin, although California was not immediately affected by this declaration because Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico uh, take cuts first. And you know, as a result, overall of these warming temperatures, 
we see impacts in how runoff emerges in the system. And we are now seeing groundwater impacts in the Sacramento Valley, which is basically California's wettest area in terms of developed water supplies that are similar to the kind of impacts that we expect in the San Joaquin Valley. And when we talk about impacts, you know, this drought is not our first rodeo, and we have a good handle on what kinds of impacts to expect. Um, the impacts in red here are health and safety impacts. And the big ones that jump out are wildfire. And I should point out using CAL FIRE's statistics of the top 20 fires in uh, the historical record, all but two of the top 20 fires in terms of fire size and damage caused by the fire have occurred in this century. So um, clearly we are seeing a different pattern going on with fire behavior and we are seeing significantly increased impacts to water systems, including large urban systems than we've seen previously. And with respect to managed uh, water supplies, small water systems have always struggled during drought and we are seeing increasing numbers of problems there because small systems don't have the resources to um, diversify supplies, to obtain new supplies, and typically they have infrastructure limitations. Also, often they're located in rural areas that are on fractured rock groundwater, which is a high vulnerability uh, situation during drought. So what have we learned from our long experience with droughts? Definitely, we are now clearly seeing that we need to think about how increased temperatures are creating new and more severe impacts, uh, such as the wildfire impacts. And really what this tells us is that we need to shift our thinking from drought is an emergency that occurs occasionally, we respond to it, and then we go on about our business when conditions turn wet, that uh, we now need to recognize that we're actually seeing a climate transition to a warmer and drier climate. And the supplies that we planned on having on the past are not the supplies we can plan on having in the future. So we really need to shift our thinking about towards resiliency rather than um, just the occasional emergency mode. And speaking of uh, it will get wet sooner or later again, this year we saw a great demonstration of California's uh, high variability in water supply conditions, both within a single year or across multiple years. If you think about our last drought of 2012 to 2016, for example, uh, you might remember that that drought was ended by a very wet 2017 for most of the state, excepting the Central Coast. And in fact, the Central Coast continued on in dry conditions for two additional years. And Santa Barbara was still running an emergency pumping operation at its Lake Kachuma until early 2019. So we have to recognize that not only do we have temporal variability, but California is a big state and we have high spatial variability. So where are we now in terms of drought in California? Well, we still have a statewide drought emergency proclamation in place. And the three weeks of wet conditions that we experienced end of December, early January, uh, certainly has improved reservoir storage and uh, snowpack conditions. Although uh, since we did not have a whole lot of precipitation since that very wet period, the snowpack numbers are now dropping and along with the runoff forecasts. But we really need to recognize that groundwater, which is a very important resource during drought, um, has been substantially depleted, not just in the current drought, but the prior drought, and really throughout this century, literally. So we are not going to see a recovery of that uh, groundwater storage that has been lost uh, due to the current drought. Similarly, we are not going to see, because of one wet year in the Colorado River Basin, uh, recovery of the full capacity of Lake Mead and Lake Powell because those storage facilities like groundwater basins have been significantly depleted over the long term. 
So we are looking at a future with less um, supply from these sources of storage. And just to wrap up uh, for more information on this topic, you can find these reports on our website where we talk about how drought impacts have changed over time and the lessons that we've learned from these droughts. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, uh, Casey? Welcome, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of the discussion today. I'm Cassie Chahan. I'm with Fresno Irrigation District. I'm, I'm new to the irrigation world by about four years, but have learned a ton on particularly the importance of a district, special district, small special district like Fresno Irrigation District in times of drought and in times of plentiful rainfall and snowpack. So I'm excited to talk to you today for a few minutes on what maybe is a lesser known district in the water world, but in my mind, a very important one. So thanks again for having me. So, um, and I also can appreciate Janine's uh, technical challenges and it actually is a perfect segue into the, the comments that I prepared for today's discussion. So just to get us situated, Fresno Irrigation District is located in Fresno County, and uh, we have a boundary that is about 250,000 acres. We are situated in between the Kings River and Millerton Lake. That will become vitally important as I talk to you about our drought mitigation strategies and um, have the ability to import about 500,000 acre feet of water annually. Our boundary includes the city of Fresno, the city of Clovis, so we have a large urban core, and we also have smaller uh, communities like the city of Kerman and Biola Community Services District and um, have um, a strong reliance on groundwater pumping. Many of the districts within the um, boundary only use groundwater to meet their domestic needs within their service area. In addition to that, FID's area, the light green area on the map, is accounts for about 130,000 acres of irrigable agricultural lands. And that's important, too, because Fresno County is the number one ag producing county in the nation. At least we were in 2021. We were dethroned in 2022, but still one of the top ag producing countries, counties in the nation. And that's important, too. And, and striking this balance between the world's food supply and the water available for growing that food is vitally important. Fresno Irrigation District plays a huge role in that. And I'm excited to share with you some of the efforts that are underway. So I will start just with some highlights. The district was formed in 1920. We um, have a staff of about 88. We have 680 miles of canals and pipelines. That essentially takes the water in from um, Kings River primarily, also San Joaquin River, um, and brings it into the service area so that we can make beneficial use of that water supply. It is We have about 870 acres currently of basins, groundwater recharge basins, where we can utilize that supply, bring it into the region, and allow it to percolate into the underground. Our primary supplies are the Kings River water supply and the San Joaquin River. So the San Joaquin River, we're a class two contractor. We have um, a 75,000 acre feet of water available as a, as a class two contractor. And then city of Fresno within our boundary is a class one contractor and they have a supply of 60,000 acre feet of water. So we have good entitlement when it's available, but that's not always the case. And as an ag producing um, county, what happens when there's no surface water, we turn to the groundwater supply. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we balance that and how we work with our partner agencies to make sure that when those rains come and those floods come and the snow starts to melt off, like Janine was just talking about, we're positioned to capture as much of that as possible so that we can replenish the groundwater um, in that has uh, and the depletion that has occurred over the months where we did not have surface water available. So in addition to the Kings River and the San Joaquin River, which I've already talked about, we also have these, what we term the East Side Creeks. And the, there's um, 
seven east side creeks that also route water into the area when they are flowing. So when those heavy rains come, those atmospheric rivers come, they start to run off and they bring water into the region. If we are not positioned to capture that, and if we hadn't invested in some of the infrastructure that you're seeing on the map here, that water would be lost to the region. So we work very closely with Fresno, Fresno Metropolitan Flood Control District and you will hear from uh, one of my colleagues, Brent um, Sunamoto, after I finish my comments, but it's an extremely important partnership that keeps Fresno from flooding, keeps the urban core safe from flood damage, but it also allows us to make beneficial use of those flood waters by bringing it in, using these facilities that are located or are shown on the map, and the 680 miles of canals and pipelines that Fresno Irrigation District has, and in addition to the basins. So it's it's really, really important. And in a year like we saw just recently, the end of December to the beginning of January, we saw these creeks flowing. And I have some pictures that I'll show if, if my 12 minutes isn't up by the time we get there. So in terms of balancing that supply, like I mentioned, when, when we're in extreme dry conditions and we're having very short irrigation seasons, the crops don't stop growing. The, they turn, our growers turn to groundwater supplies. And so the district has prided itself for many years on building recharge basins so that we could offset the pumping that is occurring. Those efforts have amplified in a post-SIGMA world and a post um, since this uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed in 2014. But it's been a priority for the district long before SIGMA was implemented, it, uh, dating back to the 1970s. And so uh, in a post-SIGMA world, everyone is capturing or planning to capture those floodwaters and make beneficial use of that water. Fresno Irrigation District is no exception to that. And so we always have a goal of routing that local stormwater runoff to FID basins and importing additional supplies such as water available from the San Joaquin River supply into the region so that again we can just have the maximum amount of impact and recharge occur within the district boundary um, when those flows are available. So what does that look like? As I mentioned, we have 670 miles of pipelines and canals. We have 890 acres of basins. And FID has positioned its basin such that you can see we have major conveyance systems. So one of those major systems for routing that urban, urban st stormwater out from these east side creeks, out from Millerton Lake and Kings River, we have um, one of those systems is the Herndon system. So we have a whole network of canals and pipelines and basins that will take the water from the urban core, which is kind of hidden by the text box here, but the city of Fresno and the city of Clovis route it out to our Easter, or sorry, our West Side basins and be able to put water in these parking spots. These small green um, boxes are all of the basins that we've um, constructed over the years so that we can park water in those basins when it's available. We have a similar system on the Dry Creek um, it's known as our dry creek system. Again, just routing water from the urban core and the, all of the east side creek basins that you saw in the previous exhibit into the local service area and then parking it in these um, basins so that we can make beneficial use of it. Lastly, we have our Fancher system that's primarily utilized for bringing those east side storm waters in that I mentioned prior from those east side creeks that drain into the district and um, importing that water and parking it into these parking spots. That is so important for the district because the, like I mentioned, the, the agricultural needs don't go away just because we're having extreme dry periods. And so the district has had to find a way to balance what's happening and make maximum beneficial use of the storm waters when they're available so that we can not continue to see groundwater decline because the other hat I wear is I'm the executive officer of the North Kings Groundwater Sustainability Agency. And from the GSA perspective, the, the groundwater levels, what we see is the water levels are continuing to decline. And so to mitigate for that, we are bringing more of the surface water in to offset in addition to um, demand reduction efforts, part particularly by the urban core who has transitioned their overall demands from primarily 
um, groundwater dating back to 2004. And over the last 20 years have really made a shift to utilizing more and more of their surface water supplies and reducing the amount of groundwater pumping that they do. The bulk of the groundwater pumping that occurs within the GSA boundary, not to confuse things, is um, in this FID service area. Why? Because we have 130,000 acres of irrigable lands and it's being used to produce the crops um, for um, that make Fresno County one of the number one ag producing um, counties in the nation. So in addition to that, I mentioned the 870 acres of basins that we currently have. The district has recently acquired 375 additional acres of land. We also are... Um, that will equate to about nine additional basins, additional parking spots. That increases our recharge potential from 18,000 acre feet with it per month with the 870 acres that we currently have to about 25,000 acre feet per month that we'll be able to recharge and put into the underground to offset the pumping that has occurred in the dry periods. That's incredible. Also adding to that is the, um, Four additional flood control basins that we are going to be um, in, um, intertying. The flood control district has 1,365 acres of basins, and Brent will share more about that. So what happens is they have the flood, the storm basins, and then they are acquiring land to allow for future growth of the municipalities. So these four basins that FID is gonna be intertying are located outside of the current city limits and they will be um, utilized in the future, but we don't know how long. So FID, because of their proximity to the conveyance system that FID has, we are looking to utilize those existing holes in the ground, again, just to enhance the amount of water and the available locations where we can put water into the underground and offset the pumping that has occurred the prior year. So, um, that is our strategy. And like I said, it's very important because we know, to Janine's point, that the, the runoff comes different than it used to. It used to be primarily in the form of snowpack. More and more, the storms are coming earlier, and it's in the form of precipitation. So if we don't capture it, we lose it to the region, and we are making a concerted effort as the district to bring the water in, capture as much of it as possible, and allow it for... Um, um, offsetting the amount of pumping that has occurred during those dry periods, which we know will also come and they're not going to stop coming in the future. So that is our strategy and it's often a hard sell um, for people who don't understand the um, importance because you you go to your ratepayers and you ask them to fund basins and then what do they see? They may see that particular piece of land dry for more years than they see water in it, but we just feel like it's vitally important for the district's long-term groundwater sustainability purposes to have these parking spots, be able to bring the water into the region and recharge as much as possible so that we can continue to produce um, America's food and um, allow our growers to continue their operations. So that's our strategy. And I think my time is just about up. If you're interested in learning more, we have a lot of information on our website and also social media, or you can always contact me directly. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Cassie. I really appreciate it. And uh, sorry for mispronouncing your name. No, that's uh, okay. <laughs> it's a hard one. Uh, um, uh, Brent, uh, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll apologize in advance. Our, our office is next to an airbase. And uh, oftentimes as I'm on a Zoom call, uh, the jets will take off or land in the middle of it and uh, you won't hear a thing, I, a thing I say. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But if it does, uh, you know, I apologize in advance. Uh, so my name is Brent Sinemoto. I'm the district engineer slash assistant general manager with the Fresno Metropolitan Flood Control District. Uh, just a little bit about the district briefly. Um, we're a special district. Uh, we were created in the mid 50s. Um, our primary services that we offer are flood control and urban storm drainage. But we do offer other services to the community that I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit as I as I go through this. Now, I understand this is a, a drought panel and our agency really doesn't participate in drought planning, drought management, you know, drought response. Um, 
But we do feel that we are part of the solution to that issue through our groundwater recharge program. And um, um, I think Cassie's uh, previous presentation is a great kind of segue into, into what we do. And um, I, I'm, so I'm gonna kind of piggyback on a lot of what Cassie had to say here. And I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna focus on our groundwater recharge program here. Okay, so I just want to show you where Fresno is. I know Cassie had a map that showed that, I, but oftentimes when I go out of town, people ask me, where's Fresno? And so, you know, it's uh, we're in Central California, and uh, this map, you know, shows um, where our county lies within uh, the state. And this is our district map. And um, so there's a lot of overlap between you know, our service area and FID's service area. And as Cassie mentioned, we are partner agencies and uh, we, we pretty much work hand in hand with each other on, you know, on a number of issues. Um, so we have two basic systems here uh, within our service area. We have our flood control system, which are these big blue uh, shapes off to the right-hand side, which would be the east side of our, of our district boundary. Um, and these provide flood control services. Um, they, they lot these facilities lie on uh, big stream courses that run through the area. And they basically allow um, water to flow in the stream courses at non-damaging rates. Uh, before this, uh, these systems were in place, uh, downtown, or not just downtown, but lots of areas of town had flooding issues due to, due to uncontrolled flood waters. And uh, thanks to these facilities that those issues have pretty much gone away. Um, our other system we have is our urban storm drain system. And so you'll notice these, all these little colored shapes here. These are, are um, urban watersheds that we call um, drainage areas. And if you, I don't know how well this map comes through on your guys' side of, of the screen, but if you look, each of these uh, drainage areas, there's a little blue shape within them. Um, these represent our urban stormwater basins. And uh, that that's where the bulk of our groundwater recharge is, is accomplished here. And so I'm gonna focus on these urban stormwater basins. Um, now, obviously we're the flood control district. So our the primary use of our urban stormwater basins is for flood protection. Um, so in the winter, when we start getting rains, like you know we're getting um, today, um, sometimes these basins will fill up and we'll have to pump them out and we will pump them over to the FID canal system. And as Cassie mentioned, they've done a great job of acquiring land and building basins east of our, our service area. And so we will pump the water to their canals and um, luckily for the area, their system could capture the, you know, what we pump out. Um, but when it does rain, we don't pump the basins totally dry. Um, we have an operating criteria where you know, it changes month by month, and this op this operating criteria tells us, okay, when in this specific month we want to keep so much reserve storage in these basins, and so we do carry a you know we do have keep a, a water level in these basins, and we do retain uh, you know an amount of the storm water that does flow into our basins, and uh, so we you know we feel you know that our uh, operating criteria you know it, it gives us a, a nice balance between flood protection and retaining stormwater and you know and which provides stormwater recharge and so we feel it's a great benefit to the area and um you know we've we've done estimates in the past and uh our most current models have shown that we we estimate that we retain about 75 to 80 percent of the storm or at least the urban stormwater that falls over the the fresno clovis area um, so Fresno um, pretty gets pretty hot in the summer. Um, so in the in summer, spring, summer months, you know, we don't get much, if any, rainfall at all. So we, so we could put these urban stormwater basins to other uses. Um, now, two of the predominant uses, secondary uses, I should say, are recreation and groundwater recharge. So so a handful of these basins are landscaped, and in the spring and summer months, we could open the gates and allow public access and um, you know, people could do all sorts of things. They, you know, there's soccer leagues, baseball leagues. Um, you know, people use these, you know, for you know, frisbee golf. You, you name it. Um, but yeah, we do provide that benefit to the community. We do have partnerships with the par the various parks departments, um, and um, so so the public gets a lot of uh, um, green space use out of our our basin sites. Um, but the more uh, prevalent secondary use. Um, of our basins is for a uh, groundwater recharge. 
And so for, for our groundwater recharge program, so um, this will, this is what we call um, surface water recharge. So we have connections to the FID irrigation system and FID could open a valve and that will divert surface water from the FID canals into um, some of these stormwater basins. And we have about um, 90, about 90 of our basins are currently interconnected to the, to the FID system. And the water that's diverted into the basins, it's um, it comes from a water that's allocated to the cities of Fresno and Clovis. So, so these basins that sit in the city of Fresno, they get um, surface water allocation to the city of Fresno, gets diverted into those basins and basins that lie in the city of Clovis. It's a Clovis allocation. And so this is a chart we use to report our uh, yearly recharge activities and. Um, I don't know how well this shows through, but um, this leftmost bar is the year, uh, the water year 2007, and the rightmost bar is the water year uh, 2021. And so these blue bars represent imported surface water recharge in our basins. And these numbers come from uh, delivery reports provided to us by the irrigation district. Um, and, and by the way, the amounts are in acre feet, as uh, someone else previously described. Now, the red bars um, show our surface water recharge. Now, we don't really have a way to actually measure how much water is recharging through our basins into the groundwater aquifer. Um, but we do keep track of the basin water levels all throughout the, the winter. We know what kind of percolation rates um, the, the various basins have. Some have sandy underlying soils. Some are more of a, a loam. Some are even clays. Um, so we know which basins percolate well, which ones don't, and basically we do know the rates at which they do percolate. So we could we enter that data into a model, and that model um, calculates how much surface water we uh, accomplished in in a given winter. And so another thing I like about this chart is it tells a few stories. Um, one, you know, we're we're talking about drought, and when you see low these low blue bars or short blue bars that that shows that we had a low surface water delivery and so so when we there's a low amount of surface water available for recharge that generally means well we're, you know that was a drought year and then also if you look at some of the red bars some of some of them are big some of them some of them are smaller so obviously that that those are low rainfall years which ties into the whole drought you know the drought thing and one thing Cassie mentioned, she talked about being in a post-Sigma world. So, so Sigma was passed, I believe, in 2014, and we were in the midst of a drought at that point. And so one thing that really jumps out of the screen, at least to me here, is when you look at this chart, you'll notice these blue bars are much bigger starting in the water year 2016. And so that just kind of shows like what Cassie, you know, referenced as a post-Sigma world, you know, re groundwater recharge just took a much higher level of importance and urgency. And um, um, now all of a sudden, you know, agencies like us, the Flood Control District, that, that has a pretty extensive groundwater recharge program. We've kind of, we've, we've kind of turned into the cool kids and <laughs> we're getting a lot of water districts contacting us and asking us, hey, heck, can we partner up and uh, do some recharge projects together? And so moving forward here, you know, um, we're always looking for new ways to increase um, beneficial use of, of stormwater. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we generally use our urban stormwater basins uh, for groundwater recharge. And as we move forward, we're going to, you know, we're going to keep interconnecting more and more of these basins to FID's delivery system and, and increasing our uh, surface water groundwater recharge capabilities. But, you know, as, uh, as Cassie mentioned, you know, you know, Sigma has been a game changer, and we're looking for more and more uses of um, stormwater. And so, I, I previously touched on we have this flood control dis, or excuse me, flood control system, you know, on the east side of town. And uh, generally, we you know we're not allowed to store water in these facilities, um, uh, largely because they're they're um, governed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And they were designed as flood control facilities. And being such, the Corps expects you to dewater these facilities as stormwater comes in. And actually, many of these were designed to be automated. So we th there's no, there's not even a gate to shut on most of these. Um, 
But in this upper right-hand corner, we do have Big Dry Creek Reservoir, which is um, northeast portion of uh, Clovis. And we are currently exploring um, reoperating that and see if we could get that designation changed to be in a storage facility. And we're we're really in the infant stages of that right now. And uh, I would say we haven't even gotten to the start line and we've already just put a ton of effort into, into just exploring this and Cassie could attest to that as well. And uh, we have a couple of different paths moving forward, but um, you know, from what we can tell, it's gonna be a very time consuming, very arduous and a very expensive process. But in this post Sigma world we're in, um, you know, beneficial use of stormwater has um, jumped up, you know, exponentially. Thank you, Brent. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, great presentations, everyone. Um, we have a few questions. Do catch basins have a well hole for water to return to the ground? Well, uh, some of them do. We call them dry wells. Um, in general, the, um, the use of dry wells is discouraged because you know there's stormwater quality is a big issue now. And and having a almost a direct connection between a catch basin and the groundwater without any any sort of treatment is kind of a, a concern. So there are some, but um, it's kind of a discouraged use. Are developers required to allocate land for recharge uh, in flood basins? Yes and no. Um, well, first, no, in that, so we collect developer fees. And so we, so when someone develops, we assess them a fee and that fee includes their proportionate share of the pipeline system, the basin, everything we're gonna put in the basin. But so, but there's instance, many instances where they develop kind of in the middle of nowhere and maybe you know, our pipeline system might not extend to where they're developing. So in that case, they have no service and they have to dedicate, you know, a couple of lots or a piece of their property, you know, to store in their stormwater until our system's extended to them. Can uh, dry wells be used in strictly agricultural areas? You know, I don't I don't know what the rules are. My environmental manager might be able to answer that better than me. Um, but I, I assume so. But I, I don't know the legalities of that. I don't, I, it, whether it's legal or not, maybe I can just chime in, Brent. I, it's not heavily practiced. I mean, we, we are blessed with not only, um, you know, available watershed runoff, but very favorable soil conditions. And so on average, we can get about a half a foot per day of percolation. And so, I mean, that's incredible. And you think you spread that amongst all these basins, there, there's really not a huge need, at least in our service area, to try to improve on that recharge by things like dry wells and or deep well injections or anything like that, because we, we, we just have very favorable soil conditions. And I recognize that's not the reality for everyone. So like further on the west side where they encounter clays and um, tighter soils, that that maybe is a a more common practice, um, but not so much within the Fresno County, Fresno Irrigation District area. Well, uh, I, our time is up at this point. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, it's been really educational. And uh, I know that our participants uh, certainly got a lot out, out of your presentations. Brad, always nice to see you. Uh, um, and uh, thank you uh, to all of the organizations that participated. Thank you all.